Um, we were, this is 201, and we will go further than we did last time, but those of you who didn't make it last time, we will recap some of what we talked about before on the origins of the town. And I thought we would get into the 20th century during this talk, but uh, something happened between October and now, when we were um, last here, and that was uh, a chunk of the Baraboo newspapers were digitized and put online. By a happy, almost accident, Baraboo was chosen to have the Baraboo Republic digitized from 1860 to 1886, and it is now completely searchable. And while we have the hard copies uh, at the Sauk County History Center, you literally have to go page by page or grind through the microfilm to find uh, anything you want. Now we can sit in the comfort of our own homes and search for the word Abelman, and we came up with a lot of articles that were able to flesh out more about the, the early, early years of Abelman and the Colonel and that. Um, so that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. We'll get up to uh, the Colonel's death in 1880 and um, a lot of stories along the way. I spoke last time about um, how Sauk County developed and for a while during the 1830s, the Wisconsin and Fox River ways were the dividing line between white settlement to the south and east in Wisconsin and Native American lands to the west and north. And of course that didn't uh, last very long. The Ho-Chunk were coerced uh, into signing a treaty in 1837, which opened up uh, what is now Sauk County and settlers started pouring in from mainly the Madison route up through Sauk and Prairie or from Fort Winnebago at Portage. Of course, the easy pickings were places like Sauk Prairie, and once those were taken, people started to venture further inland and uh, settle along the Baraboo River Valley. One of the first things to be done after settlers came here so that they could buy land was uh, to survey it so that an orderly process could be established for knowing what land you wanted to buy. So people could come here and, you know, quote unquote, stake a claim, start uh, sitting on some land. Eventually though, the land had to be surveyed by the federal government. This is the 1845 uh, sketch map for what became the town of Excelsior. And um, uh, can you imagine doing this in the middle of nowhere with just rods and chains and, and compasses and whatnot? And they're, and they're fairly accurate and you notice that the um, Surveyor, the federal surveyor here has noted the rocky cliffs along the Baraboo River and the Narrows, Narrows Creek coming in there. So once these were, these maps were generated and this was the sketch map, this was turned into a uh, more formal map, which we'll see a little bit later, then eventually um, they would have to you'd have a surveyor come out and tell you, well, you're sitting on um, section 33, so you need to go claim such and such a quarter section or whole section of land and pay for it. Um, now the same summer that this map was done by the federal surveyor, most of the county population was down in Sauk Prairie and people didn't even know what the uh, interior of the county was like and whether or not it would um, be quote, fit for habitation. So in 1845, a expedition was mounted down in leaving Sauk. And part of that party was William H. Canfield who came here in 1842 and was the county's first surveyor and the county's first historian. So I'll read what he said about that trip <coughs> through the interior of Sauk County, including this area. In the summer of 1845 at one of these meetings, regarding the location of the county seat, a committee was appointed consisting of Augustin Harresty, who you know as the founder of Sauk City, Edmund Rentorf of Sauk City, Levi Moore, Abraham Wood, Thomas Remington, and William H. Canfield, to make an exploration of the interior of the county to ascertain whether land was fit for settlement and cultivation. It was urged by the people, <coughs> by the Sauk people, that the interior of the county was one complete mass of rocky bluffs wholly and entirely unfit for cultivation. <laughs> the committee started on their exploration on the 10th day of November, 1845. Count Harresty's mare and a week's provisions, a shotgun, two rifles, and a bird dog constituted the outfit. We took the Pinery Road to Seely Creek and camped that night in a Pinery shanty. Apparently the loggers had already been through the area. In the morning, the Count took the 
hauled her off the mare and told her to go home to her colt, and taking one day's provisions, we started into the primeval forest. The next day, Wood shot a deer but did not get it, and a partridge which the count bagged had to suffice for dinner, supper, and breakfast for six stalwart men. So all these ideas of teeming wildlife and just shooting and hitting three deer at the same time aren't exactly true. Another day of dinner, supper, and breakfast was passed with nothing but water to drink, and the next breakfast and dinner also were a blank. We intended to shoot the dog that night for supper, but Providence smiled upon us, and Captain Moore's trusty rifle brought down a fine yearling buck, whose fat sides and hams were soon to be seen in pieces, roasting around the fire on sticks. Here's the part that involves this area. We crossed over the headwaters of Honey Creek, passed on to Bear Creek, thence down Narrows Creek to the Baraboo River, and thence to Baraboo. So some of the first settlers or first people in the area in 1845. The committee reported to a subsequent mass meeting that the interior of the county was not only fit for cultivation, but would make a fine agricultural district. So it was to that environment that um, this man came, Colonel Stephen von Rensselaer Abelman, came to Wisconsin in 1848. He was born in 1809 in the town of Bethlehem, uh, Albany County, New York and like many New Yorkers, came west. Uh, he was born to Christian and Regina Abelman as the 11th child of 12 children, so his mom was nursing or pregnant for 25 years. And they were no small babies, apparently. This is his father. We're fortunate to have several paintings that hang, hung in Colonel Abelman's home here in Rock Springs at the Sauk County Historical Museum. This is his father, Christian Abelman, who was born about 1761 in Prussia. He was kidnapped and conscripted into the Hessian army to fight with the British in the American Revolutionary War. He went to Canada in 1718, then came down into New York, got sick, this is during the war, was captured and was held at Fort Ticonderoga. Sometime later he married Regina Kinnear, who was born in 1788 in New York to um, parents who had arrived from Bordeaux, region of France. When Colonel Abelman was about 11, he moved with his parents to Albany and was enrolled in school there. When he was about 16, he enlisted as a drummer in the National Guard. After seven years, he was elected as captain, and in 1838, he was commissioned a colonel of the 240th Regiment of the New York State Militia. And that was a title that, of course, he held and was revered for the rest of his life. By this time, both of his parents had died, his dad in 1837 and his mother in 1831. So with no ties to New York, he came west. By that time, however, he was also married and had two children. He married Elizabeth Bolt Jarvis, and unfortunately we do not have a picture of her. Married her in 1831, he was 21 years old. This is their son, Stephen Decatur Abelman, also a portrait that we have at the Historical Museum. He was born in 1832 out in New York, came here with his parents. Now, I haven't been able to track this down, but Stephen uh, died in 1853 by drowning in the Bay of San Francisco. We have no idea why, who, what, why, well, we know why, when, but not sure why that happened. So we'll have to see if we can figure that one out. The second child was Laura Elizabeth Abelman, born in 1836, of course, also came here with her folks around 1848. Now, Stephen von Rensselaer Abelman was described as, quote, a man of Herculean build weighing 312 to 325 pounds. No spindle-legged furniture would for him in a Chippendale drawing room do. Total wreck would have followed any attempt of his to be seated. During the administration of Franklin Pierce, Colonel Abelman was appointed the United States Marshal for Wisconsin and went in Washington to receive his appointment was introduced to President Pierce, who after surveying him for a moment said, well, Colonel, you are Abelman by name, a nobleman by nature, altogether you are a colossal man. Let us shake. So with that, he became a U.S. Marshal. And if you get online, you can look him up. He was quite famous in Wisconsin with the um, Fugitive Slave Act and a fugitive slave named Glover in Milwaukee. Abelman was a carpenter and contractor in Albany um, 
He had been apprenticed in the trade as a young man, and he was also an alderman in Albany as well. But he came to Milwaukee in 1845 and set up the first planing mill there and made doors and sashes. In 1848, he made his first visit to Sauk County, laid claim to the property where Narrows Creek meets the Baraboo River, because he eventually knew that um, this would be a great potential for the railroad. Before he moved here though, or after he claimed his land, he still lived in Baraboo because there wasn't much, there wasn't anything here. And while in Baraboo, he kept busy by building such structures as the Methodist Church, as seen here. He also provided the plans for Baraboo's Octagon Jail. This was Sauk County's first real jail, replacing a rather flimsy log, log cabin jail that they had earlier, and the plans for this six-sided hexagonal jail were drawn by Stephen Abelman. He didn't get the contract to build it, but he did design it. And this sat where the Baraboo Post Office sits today. Colonel Abelman also reportedly built and uh, possibly drew the plans for the House of Seven Gables in Baraboo as well. So he was well-versed in all the popular styles like hexagon and octagon houses and Gothic revival structures in the mid-1800s. But it wasn't long before Colonel Abelman got out here to his property or his claim, and on the east side of the Baraboo River, built a log cabin, and then began hauling lumber from Baraboo to erect a proper house. The log cabin was big enough for his family and six carpenters that were working on the house and later he donated the log cabin for use as a school. Now we believe this is Colonel Abelman's uh, frame house that he built after the log cabin. It was described by Mrs. Eva Alexander in 1924. That house was not in the center of the village, but the only one on the east side of the river until you came to that of Major Williams, the first farm to the east. This was really a farmhouse also and had a very large barn and barnyard and garden. Everyone who came to the colonels was made to feel the human kindness which filled their hearts and overflowed toward all their guests, who were many, so many that Edward Gilmore, the colonel's stepson, once suggested that they'd better hang out a sign and call it the Hotel de Marianne, after his second wife's name. Now the house burned some years later. We haven't been able to uh, pinpoint the exact date, probably the later 1880s, after the colonel was dead. One piece of it that we have is this uh, looks like a statue of George Washington, which it is, but this is a piece of cast iron that sat on top of the colonel's stove in that house and acted as a radiator warming up from the little Franklin stove underneath and uh, eventually radiating warmth to the uh, room. So that made it uh, out of the colonel's home. It was eventually out at Devil's Lake for a while in front of the Cliff House on the North Shore as a statue and eventually was donated to the Sauk County Historical Museum. Now in 1855, the Colonel's daughter, Laura, married a man named Edward Watson. He was from New Hampshire and one of the early settlers in this area as well. And we'll see as we go through some of the articles we found that Edward Watson was basically the Colonel's right-hand man in all affairs here in the uh, new settlement. So after the house was built, one of the first things that Abelman did was set up a sawmill about 1857. Also that year, this is not a picture of it, but something similar. Also that year, the town of Excelsior was formed and the Colonel gave it, was allowed to, actually the town was named after the settlement of Excelsior, which later became Abelman. Um, so the town was named after the settlement. And of course, uh, the Colonel named it Excelsior because that's the New York State motto. A year after this map was drawn in 1860, his wife, Elizabeth Jarvis Abelman, dies. <coughs> she had uh, been plagued with chronic rheumatism for over 11 years, so had it certainly when she came here and eventually succumbed to complications from that at the age of 47. Now into the papers we go, and we'll see a lot of uh, uh, newspaper articles. These are from the Baraboo Republic, which I mentioned are now available online. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to me later and I can point you in the right direction. This is an ad from, or a little article from 1861. It's the first time we see 
the term Abelman's Mill, which was often the name for the settlement here. There really wasn't an incorporation yet or a, even a proper plat, but you had to refer to it as something, so it was called Abelman's Mill. And shortly thereafter, Abelman's Mills, because we'll talk about his flour mill in a second. <coughs> he did start a flour mill in 1861. Um, and uh, this is an ad from about six years later in 1867 where we see Abelman flour, forgot the S, but Abelman's flour being sold in Baraboo. And of course, in those days, the late 1850s, 1860s, wheat was king here in Wisconsin. Here's another little ad. Something like this we would never find without the aid of a computer. Usually when we scan these papers, we're looking at local history articles, not all of these legal ads. But here we see uh, somebody being a um, um, court case or something, but it's... Um, they need to go to the store of Monsieur Abelman and Watson. So here we have evidence that Watson, his son-in-law, and uh, Abelman had a store already here in the village. 1863, uh, Stephen von Rensselaer Abelman is, is uh, actively trying to peddle the property here in the settlement that he has. This is an ad from the paper, and I'll read a bit of it to you. Kind of funny, new homes in an old settlement. It's all of, you know, about 10 years old. But um, in the well-settled and improved central part of this county, I offer for sale four or five extra good farms, each comprised of good soil, good wood, and good water, with small improvements on each, with good roads to all, and in a most excellent neighborhood, all located within three quarters to one and a half miles from the following convenient facilities already in successful operation. These being the school and mail, a superior grist mill, sawmill, blacksmith shop, cooper shop, wagon maker shop, and carpenter and joiner shop. But the interests of the public, as daily expressed, now demand the addition of general merchandise, boot and shoemaking, public house, and other industrial and mechanical pursuits, here so much needed, making it necessary to offer any or part of all of the above interest for sale, as the business here requires a few good businessmen, with capital sufficient to satisfy the demand, and with that view I assure the public that I will sell at a low figure any or all of the above named interests with lots for business facilities or favorite lots for residences. And it goes along to describe the location. So he was actively trying to build up uh, the community here as early as 1863. This is uh, the colonel's second wife, Marianne uh, Watson. Uh, she'd been married twice before. And as it happens, she was the, I gotta get this right, the sister of his son-in-law's wife. So that makes her, that makes Edward Watson not only his brother-in-law, now, or his son-in-law, now also his brother-in-law. So <laughs> wrap your heads around that. She was about 16 years, this obviously much later picture, she was about 16 years younger than the colonel, and um, it worked. So shortly after their marriage in 1865, the hops craze started here in Sauk County. And uh, the colonel was certainly uh, one to take part. The hops crop out in the eastern part of the United States had uh, failed due to the hops louse and other problems. And people here, especially in Sauk County, realized that they could grow hops quite easily and it became quite profitable in the 18, late, mid 1860s, right after the Civil War. Uh, Abelman, in an article from 1866, was reportedly offered 61 cents a pound for his hops. The, uh, editor found that quite incredulous, thinking it must be a typo. In 1865, uh, hops were going at 40 to 50 cents a pound, netting $300,000 total sales in 1865. And it was estimated that in 66, the crop would be 25% bigger and 33% more in price, um, netting $500,000. By 1867, the top was hit and over a million dollars in 1867 money, mind you, in hops 
was sold here in Sauk County. Now, to, to pick all that hops, it was labor intensive at the back end to harvest it, so you needed to hire a lot of young men and ladies to uh, pick it. They'd take down the hops, pull, lay it down, and then they could pick the hops off into buckets. And you needed a lot of uh, help to come in from outside to do that. And in this ad to hop growers, the kernel is actually listed as a reference to people wishing to employ John Rothwell from Milwaukee to provide hops pickers. So the kernel was, was all in with the hops um, craze, growing it as well as um, picking it. Now there's another story. This is probably the seminal story for hops in Sauk County in 1867. And the kernel is mentioned here. This is late or mid-December of 1867 in the Bear River Republic. And it's the reporter uh, talking about um, one story of uh, the fortunes that were made and lives changed by the hops craze. Dropping into the Sauk County Bank the other day, I was overjoyed to meet old Uncle Simons, who had just returned from Kilbourne City, having marketed his last bale. His hops had been passed as strictly prime, and his seven acres had netted him $8,000. The old man clutched the heavy roll of greenbacks with nervous hands, and were it not for the support of the counter, his trembling frame would have sunk to the floor. The worthy president of the bank greeted his new customer in tones of kindly cheer, for old Simon's face, as well as his hard struggle for subsistence, had long been known to all. Well, Thomas, cheering up as the kind words of the bank president fell upon his ear, old Simon's has had a tough time of it these 18 years past, tugging among the stumps and rocks of the Baraboo Bluffs. It is now some four years since that good neighbor of mine, Colonel Abelman, God bless him, advised me to plant out a few acres of hops as being the only thing my failing strength would allow me to cultivate. You know my two boys were with Sherman and there was, they, and there was none left at home but the old woman, Charlie's wife, and my two grandchildren. I fancied the Colonel's idea, but the old woman had got into her head that it was un- Christian-like to raise him, and pleaded so hard I gave it up for a while. But Thomas, the banker, that mortgage to old Blixen was eating us out of house and home. Our taxes were unpaid, the children were in rags, and things were looking squally generally, and I determined at last to override the old woman's opinion for the sake of getting bread and butter. Last year I put out the yard, and as you know, I paid the expenses cleared up the taxes and paid off old Blixen and had only to thank the colonel for the roots. Now there's $8,000 that'll clear off the hop house, as seen here, and all my debts and the $6,000 goes right smack into Uncle Sam's bonds. The old man was here interrupted by the appearance of a new lumber wagon drawn by a good-looking pair of horses decked in all the glory of a silver-plated harness. The reins handled by a sturdy Parsonage, whom we recognized as the returned veteran Charlie. The old woman occupied a position of the spring seat, and whilst in the rear end of the wagon loomed up a goodly pile of bundles and boxes. As the eyes of old Simons passed at the ladder, he said, I told the old woman to lay in a good stock, and I see that she's done it. Yesterday I traded off the oxen and bought me that team, and now I am a going to have a buggy too. These old bones were about going to pieces, jostling over the rocks on the hard plank seat. Yes, Thomas, old Uncle Simus takes it easy the balance of his days. The boys can have the farm and the bonds will keep the widow or the woman and me. Bidding adieu, Simon got into the wagon and drove away, but not until the new bank book showed a balance of $6,000 to his credit in the Sauk County Bank. We could narrate hundreds of incidents equally satisfactory in their results as the above, but time and space per forbid. Perhaps no person is so alive to the fact of the great abundance of money and the necessity of having a place for its safekeeping as friend Thomas at the Sauk County Bank. The architectural skill of E-Towns and Mix of Milwaukee has placed him in possession of a substantial building built of famous brick of Cream City, the ponderous doors of its burglar and fire defying safe, affording absolute safety to the valuables that may be entrusted to its keeping. So this is still where the Baraboo National Bank sits today, and that 
building was financed by hops. <coughs> so we start to get some regular kind of descriptions of Abelman through the years. This is from 1868. And we see that um, there's a good abundance of pine logs being turned into lumber here. There's been a new bridge at uh, the Baraboo River, which we'll see was not, not to last very long before it was replaced, but uh, new at the time. And this is also the first uh, and only mention that I've found so far of the hotel that Abelman would build, uh, eventually called the Charter House. The new hotel of Mr. Abelman looked rather at a standstill it will, however, when finished, be a very creditable structure and add much to the looks of the place. So that's the first time on the radar that we've seen mention of what would become the Charter House. We don't have a picture of the Charter House. It's kind of amazing. It lasted until the 1880s. Uh, this is a similar tavern and hotel up at Newport, the failed settlement at Newport, the Steel Tavern. And descriptions of the Charter House make it sound much like establishments like that, or here's another tavern built in 1849 in Knowlton, Wisconsin. Mrs. Alexander, we quoted earlier, described the Charter House in later years. A great parallelogram of a house standing broadside to the wide open space between it and Narrows Creek, with no houses between except the mill on the creek bank and Mr. Stein's dwelling house and store. At this time, all of the vast open space between the Charter House and the creek the river and the rise of land to the west where the road from the bridge over the river climbed the hill and went past the little log schoolhouse and the few small houses clustered there out into the country beyond was included in the great mill yard so this would be north of main street which was a very busy place some days crowded with many teams and men loading and unloading at the mill and going here and there wherever their business called them the charter house was about two and a half stories high facing this mill yard and extending back quite a distance. The road crossing the eastern side of the mill yard and toward the south, which would be the DD um, today. The front entrance was somewhat to the east of the center of the front and had a platform and steps extending from the front door to the ground, furnishing seating capacity for loafers, youngsters, or others. The door opened into a wide hall extending straight through to a large dining room in the rear, the kitchens being back of that. On the west side of the central hall, the stairs ascended to the upper stories and a door opened into the three or large four rooms occupied by the family keeping the hotel, and one of these was used as a parlor for guests of the house. Across the wide hall in the northeast corner of the building was the office, and I believe these in the dining room was a small room used for whatever purpose desired. The charter for the Baraboo Airline Railroad was signed at the Charter House, I believe, and there was a grand feast on that occasion, and the hotel received its name thereby. One other picture of a typical establishment uh, from the era. Not sure where that one is. Um, that's about the best we can do for a picture of the Charter House, an ad from later years uh, publishing uh, its uh, amenities. So again, this sat right where the gas station sits today, faced north, and the mill yard was across the street encompassing all of that land north of Main Street. Now here's another uh, fun story. On Friday night last, the office of Ab Abelman and Watson was broken into and a valuable rifle stolen. These gentlemen offer a reward of $25 for the rest of the thief. They also offer a like amount for the arrest of the burglar who broke into their office and dwelling house in December last. In the event that these arrests are not made, they offer that if the thieves of Sauk County will give them notice, naming a time that will be best suit their convenience, they will furnish the said thieves as good a dinner as the market will afford. To this invitation, however, is appended an inv intimation that they have still on hand a small arsenal of rifles, muskets, and revolvers. And the, sheriff, the sheriff was a long ways away. Now, the next thing to come on the horizon for Mr. Abelman was the lack of a railroad. We believe that he chose the site here because he knew that any railroad that was going to come through the area would most likely uh, have to pass through the gorge here um, to get through. It was the easiest route. But the problem was that um, Sauk County had been bypassed by the railroads almost since its inception. First railroad to come through Sauk County was the 
Milwaukee and St. Paul line, which just jot into uh, Sauk County down here at Spring Green, actually started the village of Spring Green and left the county and went off to uh, Minnesota. The next railroad to come close was up at Kilbourne, and there's a whole famous story of how they thought it was going to pass at Newport, which was a flourishing town of some 2,000 up by the Dells. And Byron Kilbourne pulled some shenanigans and said, I'll make my own city where the land is cheaper, and started Kilbourne, which is today Wisconsin Dells, and that's where the um, railroad crossed in mid-1850s. So it wasn't impossible to get to a railroad, but it was awfully darn hard. And of course, the problem being the Baraboo Bluffs right here. It was easier to go around and down here where it was much flatter. Attempts were made through the 1860s to try and entice railroads to come, but it was just uh, too insurmountable. And then the Civil War came along, and that um, tied up everybody's attentions for a while. And of course, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Abelman chose the settlement here because of the uh, pass through it that would eventually accommodate a railroad. But it was really Abelman that helped get the railroad here. In 1869, he started publishing articles in the Baraboo Republic under the surname Locomotive, and he urged the people to organize, and if nobody was going to come build them a railroad, they should organize and build one themselves. So eventually, a convention was organized uh, in November of 1869 at the courthouse in Baraboo, which was the old brick house in the middle of the square. And all the big mucky mucks from Waniwak uh, all the way down to Merrimack and beyond convened at the courthouse and elected Stephen Abelman as the president of their new group to push for a railroad. Eventually, the Baraboo Airline Railroad was chartered, and they got a charter from the legislature and started buying up property rights, especially through the Devil's Lake area. And Colonel Abelman was tasked in getting property rights from Baraboo to Reedsburg. Well, this finally caught the eye of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, which um, bought out the rights that bought out the Baraboo Airline Railroad and built the railroad through the Baraboo Bluffs. And this was quite an undertaking. There was more material moved from Madison to Baraboo, they say, than from like Milwaukee up to Green Bay. Um, so just mind-boggling handwork that had to be done to bring the railroad. So this is from 1871, and among other things, a new store is going up here in Abelman. A new road is being surveyed to Loganville through the timber. Two public parks are actually dedicated, which is quite amazing for that uh, early a period. And uh, as was typical, half a dozen shanties were put up for the railroad workers that were building the track through the area. And it was decided, um, as you can see at the bottom there, that they would call the station um, uh, Abelman dropping the word Mills. Not a picture from our area, but uh, similar track layers reached uh, Abelman in eight, the December of 1871 and continued on when weather permitted up to Reedsburg. By the end of 1872, the track had crossed the entire county. This is probably, I will show you one other picture, but I believe this is probably the earliest known picture to date, and I hope we can be proved wrong, of Abelman. And this, is, of course, is the depot. Um, somebody dated this 1873. That's probably about right. Uh, on the other, right where the tracks are today. On the other side, on the east side of the tracks, this is Colonel Abelman's house. And if we zoom in, I wish the picture was a little better, but uh, if we zoom in, you can see the early, quite handsome Abelman Depot right there. It's a little bit different than the depot. I'm not sure when that depot was replaced. It became much smaller and turned into something like this, which of course is now at the Mid-Continent Railway Museum, labeled as North Freedom. But at least it still survives, as many of them don't. So after the railroad came, of course, then there was much greater opportunity for the goods from this area to get out, people to get here, 
and whatnot. So this is an uh, ad from 1872, February of 1872, shortly after the railroad became fully functional, and talks about the um, great things going on here in Abelman. So Abelman has a first-class lumber mill owned by Abelman and Watson, a custom flouring mill, and a hotel owned by the same parties, a restaurant, two or three stores, a schoolhouse, wagon shop, smithies, etc. The depot is some 80 rods from the hotel on the opposite side of the Baraboo. Two bridges over the Baraboo River, one a very good structure, and one over Nero's, Nero's Creek that is not so good. Mr. Watson buys grain, pork, and other farm produce and gives liberal price prices. Last evening, 40 couples came from Baraboo for a dance at the hotel where Mr. Abelman acts the host to the universal satisfaction of all. So you see, notwithstanding the abundance of hills, we are not entirely isolated from civilization. Truly, a, um, they, they were not isolated once they got the railroad. Here's another ad from that year. Um, talking about some of the improvements here. Also, um, let's see, this is the one talking about some new store buildings going up, a brick store possibly in the coming season, and some other things that are going on. Considerable business is done here and at Bloom's in the purchase of wood for shipment by rail. Anybody know where Bloom's was? That was North Freedom. One of the early names for North Freedom, Master Mr. Mr. Bloom. So uh, besides all of the um, commerce that could take place with the railroad, people could also think about excursions to Madison, something completely unthinkable before the railroad came through, a one-day excursion to Madison, leaving Abelman at 7 a.m., picking up, uh, I don't know why it took an hour to get to Baraboo, but picking up Baraboo at 8 o'clock, arriving in Madison at 10.30, and staying there for about six hours, leaving at 4.45, uh, even a picnic at the Capitol Park. Uh, another reference to Watson's Hotel at Abelman, this would be the Charter Hotel. Not sure why they called it Watson's in that uh, instance, but the Charter House may have been a name that was attached to the hotel a little bit later. Here's a story of a burglary at Abelman, kind of a theme. <laughs> Between 12 and 2 o'clock Monday night, the safe in the office of E.D. Watson, station agent at Abelman, was blown open by burglars and robbed of about $2,000 in notes and cash. I'm not sure if that was at the station or at the hotel or somewhere else. Entrance into the office was gained through the window and the safe door was charged with gunpowder underneath the lock, the burglars using a punch for that purpose. The door was blown off the hinges. The explosion awoke a young man who was sleeping in an adjoining room, but not knowing what disturbed his slumbers and suspecting no harm, he looked upon the scene just in time to see a stranger make his exit through the window. Mr. Watson, Colonel Abelman, and others were soon upon the grounds, but the birds had flown. Sheriff McGinnis, however, is after them, and although he has no personal descriptions of the thieves to guide him, we hope to soon hear of their capture. Yep. Now, in 1873, something interesting comes upon the papers. By private letter, we are informed that on the 30th ultimate, the saw and grist mill together with the charter house and drug and grocery store occupied by Salati and Pearl, a building adjoining and five acres of land at Abelman was sold to N.W. Salati, M.D. of Reedsburg, and W.A. Salati and William B. Pearl of Abelman. The price paid was $8,500. Parties took immediate possession and put men to work cleaning up the mills, purposing to have them running as soon as possible. So we get a little clear clue here that the mills weren't constantly operating and were sometimes left to stagnate. Um, but as we'll see, the um, Watson uh, took the charter house back in 1874. Now there's a little ad for uh, Bloom, which we mentioned before, North Freedom. And here this gives us some clues as to what was going on in terms of uh, commerce here. So a lot of wood, of course, Sauk County still had a lot of wood, even though the pineries had been depleted. A lot of hardwood, tamarack, and stuff was still available here. So we see um, 
in bloom, North Freedom piles of railroad ties, cordwood, and hoop poles. The said more wood has been marketed at this station than at any other on the road. Also here at Abelman, a large accumulation of wooden railroad ties and a great many logs lie in the mill yard awaiting the busy saw. Now that bridge that we mentioned earlier, I think 1868, built across the Baraboo River, must have been uncovered and didn't last very long in those days, all being untreated wood. So a new bridge was commissioned in 1874 over the Baraboo River. Now I'm not sure, I, I have a hunch this is the Narrows Creek Bridge, not the Baraboo River Bridge, but we don't seem to have a picture of the Baraboo River Bridge and they were all built the same way by the same builder. So this uh, man was Jerry Dodd, who came to be quite the bridge builder. Um, he put this up in just a matter of a few months, put up a total of seven covered bridges in Sauk County, three of them eventually being right here in the Abelman area. Um, and these are clear span bridges, as you can see. Not sure how they manage this feat, but these are three by 10, full three by 10 inch planks that are pegged and latticed together, so you're basically creating a hollow tube that has its own rigidity. Now, if you get down to Cedarburg, Wisconsin, that's allegedly the last covered bridge in place in Wisconsin. And the plaque down there says that it was made with baraboo pine. And I think it's right around the same uh, period. I haven't been able to prove it, but my hunch is that Jerry Dodd also went to Cedarburg to build that bridge because it is exactly the same style of construction. So maybe someday we'll be able to uh, prove that. <clears throat> so that was a new bridge at uh, the Baraboo River crossing. The crossing at the Narrows Creek was still quite poor and would be another year before it was replaced. So as uh, time went on and the prospects, more people came into the country and um, there was opportunities for more um, commercial operations. A cheese factory was proposed by I.W. Morley, who lived uh, east of here. And um, there were a few meetings reported in the paper, but nothing came of it here in Abelman anyways. And I believe that eventually Morley built this cheese factory on Terrytown Road, which is still standing today. So Abelman lost out on that one a little bit. Now, with the railroad also came some rough and tumble times. Here's a row at Abelman from 1875. Saturday night last, one John Ryan, a young man whose combative tendencies are frequently aggravated by an overindulgence in poor whiskey, was arrested at Madison and committed to the Sauk County Jail for assaulting E. DeShados, a saloon keeper at Abelman. The assault was made on DeShados' refusal to sell the prisoner liquor when he was intoxicated. An eyewitness states that for a few minutes, beer mugs, whiskey glasses, etc., flew through the air quite lively. An examination of the prisoner has been deferred until the result of the injuries inflicted upon DeShados are fully known. At one time, it was thought his life was in danger. Yeah, they don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> now, I haven't been able to check the land records. We just heard that uh, Salati and Pearl had purchased quite a bit of the Colonel's holdings here in town. Watson, Watson did get the charter house back, but here's a uh, ad from 1875 stating that the colonel has transferred his extensive realty at the station bearing his name to Alex McDonald of Chicago, who recently bought the upper mill property here of Terrell Thomas, that being in Baraboo, and again sold it to Mr. Hespuler of Montreal. Now we do know that McDonald did, uh, from later articles, own the mill property and some of the other property and try to develop it more here in Abelman. <clears throat> so by this time, the colonel who was approaching 64 was uh, starting to slow down a little bit, I think, and think about retirement. So I'd like to read now a little trip to Abelman from 1875. The lovers of nature in her most picturesque and wildest grandeur would do well to visit the vicinity of Abelman, the wonderful narrows of the Baraboo. One is awed into silence as he stands at the base of a mighty ledge of rock stretching miles along unbroken 
towering up in many points majestic and grand, and thinks of the great upheaval that casts them from nature's bosom. What sermons can be read from stones like these? What books in the running brooks at their side? Upon the, upon the decaying trunk of one old tree were 11 varieties of moss. At the entrance of a narrow gorge, one great rock stood out upon a plain alone, like a central sentinel, and so intelligent it looked, one exclaimed involuntarily, what are you standing here alone for? Do you not get tired of the ceaseless murmur of this water? Or are you guarding mis mysteries so absorbing you never feel to complain? Two days only afforded us an introduction to the charms of this scenery, and two weeks could not exhaust its attractiveness. We most cordially recommend the Charter House to summer tourists. The host and wife, with their sojourners and friends, make it a most agreeable stopping place. You will not be called from a meal to take a train if there is not another till the next day, and you will indeed be hard to please if, upon learning that you are really left, you hear that the proprietor did not wish your supper disturbed. Comforting assurance and quite an original feature in hotel keeping. We predict for him a house overflowing, time enough for meals, and the next night and day to get off in. Long live the Charter House and Mr. and Mrs. Salati, who apparently at this time are still running the establishment. Now they mentioned the next year in 18, uh, or 1875, a new bridge was uh, scheduled for the Narrows Creek crossing. Uh, this is Narrows Creek, and it predates the covered bridge that we'll see in a second, so this is one of the other earliest known photos of the area. So it'd have to be before 1875, or right before it was replaced, maybe. So I believe this is the Narrows Creek uh, Bridge. And if you think otherwise, please pipe up, let me know. Opened in August of 1875, and again built by Jerry Dodd, the now famous bridge builder. That June of 1875, a census was taken, probably the state census, and uh, the enumerator in the paper noted that there were 111 people in the recently surveyed plat of the village of Abelman. So things were up in uh, 1875, as evidenced by this article. Matters at this point are looking up and everything is progressing finely. We have Mr. Rusk here from Reedsburg moving buildings, preparatory to building a block of stone stores two stories high on the lots north of the hotel. Ground is also being cleared for the stave factory. Mr. McDonald is in Chicago at present, but will return this week when they will commence operations on the dam. Repairs are going on at the hotel, Charter House. A number of lots have been sold already and the purchasers are preparing to build. The foundation for the Baptist Church has been laid and the lumber for its completion is on the ground. Colonel Abelman is preparing to build his new residence. All in all, things are assuming a business aspect here. Not sure if, I don't think Colonel Abelman got around to building a new residence, and I certainly don't think there were any two-story stone uh, stores built here, but that was the talk at the time. Now here's one of the first uh, references we see to the name Rock Springs. This is from 1875, uh, again talking about the village and it's uh, thought maybe to have the name of the post office changed from Abelman to Rock Springs. I understand that to be the name of the new proprietors wish to give the village, that being Mr. Alex McDonald. And some more there about the Charter House, again passing hands to a man named Mr. Brown. Now a little story about uh, the railroad and, and all the wonderful things it brought. It also brought some uh, danger and uh, uh, accidents. August 1875, on Tuesday of last week, Addie Dean of Madison, about 12 years of age, a niece of Mrs. Colonel Abelman, met with a serious accident at Abelman Station. She, with some other girls, was running a hand car up and down the track near the depot, and in attempting to check the speed of the hand car, by opposing her foot to a stationary box car, her leg was broken below the knee, both bones receiving a simple fracture. Dr. Hall is attending her. A blacksmith 
In another news, a blacksmith named Bernard was recently robbed by his, of his watch in the hotel by a stranger who put up for the night. The thief was captured and put in charge of a constable, but he subsequently made his escape. Always. Of course, there's the famous uh, Abelman Curve. In um, 1875, Dodd was also commissioned to build the third covered bridge in the area at the Narrows, uh, above the Narrows, crossing the Baraboo River again, and that was the third covered bridge that he built in the area. It could be this one I'm thinking with the, the rocks there in the background. eighteen seventy six we get hint of uh, one of the geological excursions to the area. Now we know of course people have been coming to see Van Nuys Rock for a hundred years, but that uh, in eighteen seventy six was the first mention that I could find of uh, a group coming here to study the geology. Now in eighteen seventy seven something strange happens which we may or may not be able to get to the bottom of. And that is this notice of foreclosure upon the entire village, including the dwelling houses, store buildings, hotels, mill, included in the village of Abelman. And again, we never would have found this except for the computer pulling out, finding the word Abelman right there in two spots. And this is a class action or a, a lawsuit by the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company plaintiff against Stephen von Rensselaer Abelman, his wife, um, and I believe this could be the entire uh, landholders in the village listed here. The land that they talk about in the bottom of the article is the land that basically makes up the nuclear village um, of Abelman. Tried to look in the papers. There was a sheriff's sale scheduled for August 19th, 1877, and as the previous article said, they hoped they would only have to sell as much to make good on the claim, but uh, still looking into that one. Probably have to go to the Register of Deeds because here it says first suit to foreclosure mortgage dated March 5th, 1869. So we'll have to look into what that was all about. But I'm sure all of these people were thrilled to find out that their property was now entangled in a suit with the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company. Now also in 1877, a, a rowing regatta was scheduled for Devil's Lake and it was uh, held and quite popular. It was quite the attraction. Of course, with the railroad coming through the west side of uh, um, the lake. East side. east side, yes, east side. And um, Abelman, uh, as I came to read these articles, Abelman came to be a place where they apprehended a lot of people or where people ended up during a little, little escapade. And here's one from 1877. Bound to see the regatta. Two youngsters of this village, Reedsburg, one the son of Mrs. Henry Turney, aged six, and the other a son of Mrs. Mr. J.M. Cook, aged five, having heard so much said about the regatta, determined to see it for themselves. And unknown to their parents, started on Thursday morning down the track toward Baraboo. Late in the afternoon, they arrived footsore and weary at Abelman Station, where they were recognized by Mr. L.W. Gilmore, station agent, who took charge of them, fed them, and when the passenger train came along in the evening, he arranged to send them back. Fortunately, Mrs. Turney, the mother of one of the boys, was on the train and was very much astonished to see her boy so far from home. <laughs> the little fellows seemed to have had a rather dangerous experience during their journey, the younger one having become utterly exhausted and laid down on the track and gone to sleep. <laughs> during the time he lay there, the afternoon freight passed by. The older boy heard it coming and tried to awaken his companion but failed to do so and finally at a last resort rolled him off the track, thus, pro thus probably saving his life. I think so. It is a shame if someone didn't bring those boys to the regatta. <laughs> After all that. Here's another reference uh, to Rock Springs on a wedding announcement. Um, it's kind of interesting they're reporting that um, <clears throat> quite a number of people were present from Abelman, among whom were Mrs. Colonel Abelman, Ed Watson, and wife, 
Miss Nelson, Miss Gilmore, and others. Mr. and Mrs. Herford left Rock Springs on the 11 o'clock train for a trip along the shores of the Wisconsin River. We're talking about the same place, but, and then up here, a number of friends went from Baraboo to Rock Springs to be present at the wedding of Mrs. Charles Herford to Mrs. Miss Ella Abelman. Um, so again, trying to determine what we're actually going to call the place sometimes. That brings us to the death of Colonel Abelman. He died in uh, 1880 at the Charter House. And if you remember the description of the Charter House from Alexand Mrs. Alexander, there was a little room that was used for whatever purpose necessary, and that apparently is the room where he died in July of 1880. Uh, truly, as the title says there, one of the most notable characters of Sauk County. I can think of no other community in Sauk County where the namesake uh, loomed so large. Uh, John C. Logan of Loganville, I uh, don't know much about him, but uh, Colonel Abelman we certainly know a lot about and are continuing to learn uh, more about and his influence uh, in starting the settlement here. Um, but of course, as I said, that ended in 1880 when he died.